Ambassador Brendan O'Keeley, welcome to Europe Now. Thanks very much. Pleasure to be here. Ambassador, all the talk is about coronavirus the world over, and that looks likely to continue throughout or into next year. 2020 has witnessed uh, really a world under siege as a result of COVID-19. Um, I'm wondering what the current situation is in Ireland, uh, how you think the country is faring, both in terms of public health and the economy, um, in terms of dealing with COVID-19. Well, sadly, Ireland has been quite badly hit, harder hit, significantly harder hit than Australia. Uh, both the number of people um, affected, contaminated, and the people who have died have been higher. I think it's about 1,800, it's over 1,800 deaths. So it's been very serious. Uh, they're talking about moving to stage five lockdown, the Taoiseach, the Prime Minister, just announcing in recent days. So it's, it's had a very significant impact, the public health demands, the public health system. I suppose we are lucky we developed our public health system over recent decades, and that has put us in, in good position for that. Unfortunately, the demands being made on the health system are huge. So it's very significant, and as you know, other parts of Europe have been very badly hit. Sadly, you know, the, uh, the United Kingdom has been even more badly hit than we've been hit, and Northern, within that, Northern Ireland, and we have, uh, uh, obviously, with the border with, uh, between Ireland and Northern Ireland, that's significant. There's been a higher rate there as well, and a higher percentage terms debt rate. But, um, so that's all the um, negative side of it. I suppose um, last week the government, the Irish government of Ireland, announced its its budget, and it's uh, the COVID nineteen budget. I suppose is how it was commonly being mm. called in the media. And I suppose one of the interesting things is that um, the economy hasn't been as hard hit in proportionate terms as some other European Union countries, and that was to do with the fact that we were we have been taking corrective measures in the budgetary situation. You'll recall that Ireland was very, very, very badly impacted by the global financial crisis. And we've been taking corrective measures since then. And we've had things like, the, I think it's a phrase called the rainy day fund, the 1.2 billion uh, euro uh, fund for contingency and other me me corrective measures were being taken. So at the economic level, it's not been as bad as it could have been. And I suppose the other great thing is because we've been so successful at attracting in so much foreign direct investment in, in fintech, in uh, technology, in pharma, and they are very rich export markets. And they've been quite robust, particularly pharmaceutical exports, as I understand it, continue to be very successful. And they've somewhat cushioned the economic impact. Out to the end of 2020, to what extent do you think Irish people can, as it were, stomach the increasing restrictions. There's a lot of discussion at the moment, for example, about stage four restrictions. I see, I think it was just in yesterday's Irish Times, uh, there was um, a story that made the argument that stage four restrictions might result in up to a, a billion euros impact on the economy in Ireland and over 100,000 jobs lost. Um, what's your thinking about this? Well, there are, that challenge is there, and it's a very real challenge, yeah. and I suppose there are legitimate concerns. But I think, on the other hand, if we don't tackle it, if we don't do, we say, we've seen what's happened in a number of European countries, mm. and we see what is happening in the United States, mm. that because we haven't, they haven't successfully overcome it, and there is some talk about of a second phase, uh, so we need to ensure that the measures we take are effective. And if a four or five week lockdown is what is required, I think the popular opinion has changed again. There was a reaction at one point, not as strong in Ireland as in some other countries, but I think now people realize this is really a pandemic that mm. is not going away unless mm. we take very strong, decisive, corrective measures, and the government is doing that. And I think given it's a coalition government of three parties, they have quite a broad political uh, spectrum of support for that, those policies. Earlier this year, the European Union unveiled a 750 billion euro uh, recovery package for the coronavirus pandemic, which took the EU's total spending to the pandemic um, into the trillions of euros. Um, how is Ireland contributing to that European-wide effort to fight the pandemic and to fight it at a, on a global scale? 
Well, I suppose Ireland has has, um, has become a net. We, 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 people of my age remember when we were recipients of of EU support or EEC, as we would have called it back then. But I suppose in more recent years we've been a net contributor, and I suppose that's been a very significant change and indicates the transformation of the Irish economy that the European Union is responsible for. So I think there's a feeling that it's now Ireland's turn to help other countries that are less advantage that we are. So there's an acceptance in that, that we now contribute. And I suppose it's a real, it's a, a, a lesson in self-interest. The, the entire construct of the European Union is, is the self-interest, you know, the collective self-interest is best served. So we realize that we're in a very small, compact, uh, po densely populated part of the world. Um, and if we don't solve the problem in mainland Europe, and we're still trying to facilitate some degree of communication between various parts of mainland Europe and, of course, the island of Britain, and that's, that's a priority for us. Climate change has been top of the political agenda in Europe during recent years, um, although more recently there have been a, a range of debates, claims and counterclaims, that uh, COVID-19 um, is obviously impacting very severely on the capacity and the aims of the Union to try to achieve a climate neutral EU. Um, recently, the EC president has argued that no, all is on track for the EU to be carbon neutral by 2050. Most recently, the European Council has considered the uh, stepping up Europe's 2030 climate ambition communication, uh, where a reduction target, an, an emissions reduction target of up to 55% um, is targeted by 2030. What actions um, are Ireland currently undertaking to achieve these climate change ambitions? Well, I suppose the, we, we, well, first and foremost, we'll, we uh, we're always support all, uh, actively support all the European Union. I mean, once the Council of, uh, the European Council have, have signed off on these things, and there's agreement across heads of government, and Ireland has is, is always been a very, um, uh, we've seen the benefit of, of these policies, and we're very committed to, to climate, to taking corrective measures to reduce uh, uh, CO2 emissions. We have a coalition government, one element of it is the Green Party, mm. and they've always led very strong, very str and got very strong public support. I think that's the important thing as well, is that these measures have strong popular support. The government in the, la in the budget just last week increased in uh, uh, allocation of resources into continuing to address that and reiterating our commitment to uh, the achievement of the 2050 goal. And I think that's, that's the best way we can do it. We have, I mean, we're lucky in some ways, we don't have any of the big extractive industries or the major pollutants. Um, um, uh, so we are already moving toward uh, taking steps that are in ge generation of energy and other methods. Agriculture, I suppose, is a very significant one in Ireland, and trying to address that, that that's one of the, um, one of the probably most significant pollutants in our system. So addressing that has been a very significant part of government policy and the commitment that reiterated in the most recent government. Freedom of movement has been a cornerstone of um, EU citizenship, enshrined, of course, in both the Maastricht Treaty and the Treaty of Rome. Mm. But now COVID-19 has profoundly challenged aspects of those mobility rights due to restrictions uh, based upon public health concerns. How has the EU fared uh, with navigating all of this, do you think? And I wonder what your thinking is about what future actions might be necessary to protect uh, that fundamental right to mobility as, as, as enshrined in EU citizenship? Well, I suppose COVID-19 is, if I can put it that way, a different problem. Mm. Um, I think it's, that's, a, that's a, a health problem. And the region, even within Ireland, there have been limitations of people traveling into certain areas and parts of the UK have done the same. Um, and, and, and obviously in, in, par in parts of mainland Europe, France and, and Italy have had to be. So I think that's, that's one thing. So even within countries, there has been limits on the movement. And I think transnational, I mean, if I can put it this way, uh, just what happened between the, the trans-Tasman bubble just uh, yes. yesterday, where people coming from New Zealand, non-affected, uh, largely speaking, an unaffected country by COVID, but people ended up traveling around. So there are logistical problems to dealing with that. Um, but I think the principles are there, but I think the principle of public health is primary. And I think that's the biggest challenge the EU faces. 
and taking reasonable and proportionate measures to contain the uh, ongoing spread of COVID-19 is, is a great priority. The principle of free movement is absolutely crucial. Um, when the, we enlarged um, uh, to include the 10 former uh, the Eastern European countries, Ireland was one of those countries to open up. But I'm delighted to say that now 16% of the people living in Ireland were not born in Ireland. And that is probably the first time in our history. 16% mm -hmm. of the people born in Ireland live overseas. And of course, we have a diaspora of 70 million. So free movement is fundamental to us. It has been fundamental. Like you've got a more uh, important element, I suppose, is, is that the free movement of European citizens into Ireland is what has helped our economy grow. Because you can set up a headquarters of an IT company, a pharmaceutical company in Ireland, and if you want a Czech speaker, or a Polish speaker, or a Bulgarian speaker, or a Romanian speaker, we can find them. Because he, she can travel from wherever in Europe they mm. live, and they can bring their language skill and the other skills they have, and it has benefited us. So again, Irish people have seen the very practical benefit of free movement. We've always experienced it. And now other Europeans are experiencing it by coming to us. So exactly the principles, the founding principles of the European Union of solidarity and the ability to, for Europeans to benefit from one another's skills. And we are the prime example of that. I mm. think that's why we're so pro-European Union. It's interesting you mention IT companies because digitalization, of course, has been absolutely core mm. to the recent successes of the Irish economy. Uh, the pandemic has, again, some argue, radically accelerated the digital revolution. We see this with people working, remote working and virtual workstations and so on and so forth. And the economic transformations, I think, have been absolutely massive. Uh, you know, for example, if you think of ExxonMobil, one of the most valuable companies in the US um, now doesn't even make it into the top 30, whereas mm. you know, Zoom has become a household name. <laughs> uh, some have argued that in the same way a climate emergency was declared for Europe, perhaps the EU should think of declaring a digital emergency. Um, I'm wondering what score you would give the EU and what score you might give Ireland for how it's faced recently in the context of COVID-19, the challenges of digitalization. And I'm thinking about things, for example, such as you know, upgrading the network from 4G into 5G, developments in artificial intelligence and so on. Well, I think Europe is a very significant investor in those areas. The whole, the whole you know, I'd say the Erasmus program and other programs, the European Union sponsored uh, high-end uh, research and that's been one of the, that's to keep Europe at as much in, uh, at the head of the posse as it can. I mean there's so many regions in the world challenging Europe's uh, position in, in various elements of that and, and again as I say Ireland has been very successful but we want a successful Europe so I think that's, 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 that's a, a key element of, of Europe's continued success. Ambassador, to switch focus now to Australia and your mm. role in Australia, uh, during your time as ambassador here and in terms of the work that you and your colleagues undertake at the embassy, how would you characterise the current state of relations between Ireland and, and Australia and, and the, your hopes for the development and the deepening of that relationship? Well, they're excellent. I mean, they're based on, you know, we were amongst the first Europeans to come here as part of the colonisation process. But I suppose you, uh, Australia has always been a great place for the Irish to come in this part of the world. Uh, 2.4 million in the last census, the 2016 census, said they had a, a Irish heritage. We'd estimate it's actually much higher than that. It's probably somewhere around 20, 25% if you expand it to the way we'd normally define the Irish heritage. Uh, so that's first and foremost. So there's a very strong Irish element. I think the current, the, the, the kind of, the values we have in common whether it's in the United Nations or elsewhere in the world, they're very, we share those very closely with Australia and at a global level and at a geopolitical level. And I think the people-to-people the people connections, the, the, um, the connections at a governmental level, we had President Higgins visited um, Australia in 2017. Earlier that year, the, um, the uh, uh, Governor General, Peter Cosgrove, visited Ireland. There's regular communications between ministers, Simon Birmingham, the uh, minister, uh, he or he visited Ireland, other ministers have visited, uh, we're working, we'd like to see Prime Minister come, we'd like to see the Taoiseach come here. But I, so, I think, so I think the connections are very strong. They've been strong 
people to people, they're strong political, and I say they're strong within the European, sorry, within the United Nations and within the European Union indeed. Because again, we'd say that when it comes to Australia's relationship with the European Union, historically, I would say, you've kind of looked to the United Kingdom for cultural and, and, and legal and other reasons as mm. your friend mm. within the European Union. And we, you know, shamefacedly say, you have, we've always been your friend, and now we are the one Anglophone common law country left. So I think at that political level, so when it comes to things like the free trade agreement being negotiated mm. between Australia and European Union, we certainly say we can, we, can ampl we can be part of your voice there. I mean, obviously sharing that with our EU colleagues. So I think at, at every level, within the European Union, within the United Nations, and then people to people connections are very strong. And culturally, of course, there's great similarities in terms of cinema, literature, music. So I think there's so many uh, connections between mm -hmm. both. I mean, on that last point, I think it particularly in, uh, around notions of cultural identity and national identities, mm. Uh, probably as we reach the end of every year, Australians often start to think about Ireland because we've, once, we've seen so many Irish horses come and win the Northern <laughs> Cup. No, amen, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, again, I'm just wondering about, so you think there are very good prospects for the further acceleration of particularly in terms of cultural exchange, educational exchanges of these areas that you think there's a lot more mileage in? Absolutely, and again, I go back to the fact with Brexit, uh, a lot of the opportunities, the EU funded opportunities between the United Kingdom and Australia are now gone. And those opportunities are renewed or refreshed or available in a new format with Ireland. So I think very much so, that's, that's very much a, a path forward to strengthen those ties. Mm. In terms of the European project and the notion of um, EU integration, Obviously, in recent years, there have been considerable stresses and strains upon global cosmopolitanism. Mm. Uh, we've seen this with the, over recent years, with the emergence initially of Trumpism, um, of Brexit, and the resurgence of various uh, forms of right-wing political popularism. Um, again, reflecting on your time in Australia and thinking about the values that Ireland holds dear, what how do you think the world can best seek to move forward um, at this, you know, given that it's been such a challenging time in world history, not only in terms of the pandemic, but in terms of this massive rethink mm. of political agendas? I suppose you have to go back to the history of what, what, out of what situation did the European Union grow? And it grew out of the Second World War. It was one of the most cataclysmic wars imaginable and the greatest horror of things like the Holocaust and all that. And out of that darkest, one of the darkest moments in human history, one of these most bright, you know, shining stars of global political organization, mm. the European Union mm. came about. So I think, you're, you're, I think being Irish, you have to be optimistic because 700 years of history went against us, but we became a free, a free and independent country. We got the right to self-determination and we got the right to stand in the United Nations and be a fellow member with other countries in the European Union. So basically I'm optimistic and I, I, I'm, I'm not naive and I'm not trying to diminish the problems you touch on. And I said, absolutely, they are issues. But I think Europe has been very, a very robust model and it's come through some very testing times. And I think that's the great thing about Europe, that it can come through very testing times and still continue to do what it does. And still more countries want to join the European Union. I mean, the UK is the only country that has left, but more are, are lining up to join. So I suppose that's one measure of success because people see the benefits of it, as we did in 1972 when we voted, uh, not overwhelmingly, strongly, but not overwhelmingly in favour of EEC membership. But since then, the European Union, Irish people see it as such an unqualified positive. And, and the role it can play, very importantly, I think you were touching on your question, the role the EU can play within organisations like the United Nations and the voice it brings within uh, that organisation, the collective voice of the European Union is very strong within those unions, a very significant supporter, I mean financially of mm -hmm. that, and to, to even development in a wider region in Africa and 
Pacific region, uh, uh, Latin America as well, through its development cooperation programs within those countries. So Europe is is one of the, if I say so myself, as the European star performers. Mm -hmm. Brendan O'Keeley, thank you very much for joining us on Europe Now. Thank you. Pleasure to be here.